Moby Dick by Herman Melville, chapters eighty nine to ninety one. Chapter eighty nine Fast Fish and Loose Fish. The allusion to the waif and waif poles in the last chapter but one necessitates some account of the laws and regulations of the whale fishery, of which the waif may be deemed the grand symbol and badge. It frequently happens that when several ships are cruising in company, a whale may be struck by one vessel, then escape and be finally killed and captured by another vessel. And herein are indirectly comprised many minor contingencies, all partaking of this one grand feature. For example, after a weary and perilous chase and capture of a whale, the body may get loose from the ship by reason of a violent storm, and, drifting far away to leeward, be retaken by a second whaler, who, in a calm, snugly tows it alongside, without risk of life or line. Thus the most vexatious and violent disputes would often arise between the fishermen, were there not some written or unwritten, universal, undisputed law applicable to all cases. Perhaps the only formal whaling code authorized by legislative enactment was that of Holland. It was decreed by the States General in A.D. 1695. But though no other nation has ever had any written whaling law, yet the American fishermen have been their own legislators and lawyers in this matter. They have provided a system which for terse comprehensiveness surpasses Justinian's Pandex and the bylaws of the Chinese society for the suppression of meddling with other people's business. Yes, the laws might be engraven on a Queen Anne's farthing, or the barb of a harpoon, and worn round the neck, so small are they. 1. A fast fish belongs to the party fast to it. 2. A loose fish is fair game for anybody who can soonest catch it. But what plays the mischief with this masterly code is the admirable brevity of it, which necessitates a vast volume of commentaries to expound it. First, what is a fast fish? Alive or dead, a fish is technically fast when it is connected with an occupied ship or boat, by any medium at all controllable by the occupant or occupants, a mast, an oar, a nine-inch cable, a telegraph wire, or a strand of cobweb, it is all the same. Likewise, a fish is technically fast when it bears a waif, or any other recognized symbol of possession so long as the party wafing it plainly evince their ability at any time to take it alongside, as well as their intention to do so. These are scientific commentaries, but the commentaries of the whalemen themselves sometimes consist in hard words and harder knocks, the coke upon Littleton of the fist. True, among the more upright and honorable whalemen, allowances are always made for particular cases, where it would be an outrageous moral injustice for one party to claim possession of a whale previously chased or killed by another party. But others are by no means so scrupulous. Some fifty years ago there was a curious case of a whale trover litigated in England, wherein the plaintiffs set forth that after a hard chase of a whale in the northern seas, and when indeed they, the plaintiffs, had succeeded in harpooning the fish, they were at last, through peril of their lives, obliged to forsake not only their lines, but their boat itself. Ultimately the defendants, the crew of another ship, came up with the whale, struck, killed, seized, and finally appropriated it, before the very eyes of the plaintiffs. And when those defendants were remonstrated with, their captain snapped his fingers in the plaintiff's teeth, and assured them that by way of doxology to the deed he had done, he would now retain their line, harpoons, and boat, which had remained attached to the whale at the time of the seizure. Wherefore the plaintiffs now sued for the recovery of the value of their whale, line, harpoons, and boat. Mr. Erskine was counsel for the defendants, Lord Ellenborough was the judge. In the course of the defense, the witty Erskine went on to illustrate his position by alluding to a recent Crim Con case, 
wherein a gentleman, after in vain trying to bridle his wife's viciousness, had at last abandoned her upon the seas of life, but in the course of years, repenting of that step, he instituted an action to recover possession of her. Erskine was on the other side, and he then supported it by saying that though the gentleman had originally harpooned the lady, and had once had her fast, and only by reason of the great stress of her plunging viciousness had at last abandoned her, yet abandon her he did, so that she became a loose fish, and therefore when a subsequent gentleman re-harpooned her, the lady then became that subsequent gentleman's property, along with whatever harpoon might have been found sticking in her. Now, in the present case, Erskine contended that the examples of the whale and the lady were reciprocally illustrative of each other. These pleadings and the counter-pleadings being duly heard, the very learned judge in set terms decided, to wit, that as for the boat he awarded it to the plaintiffs, because they had merely abandoned it to save their lives, but that with regard to the controverted whale, harpoons, and line, they belonged to the defendants, the whale because it was a loose fish at the time of the final capture, and the harpoons and line because when the fish made off with them, it, the fish, acquired a property in those articles, and hence anybody who afterwards took the fish had a right to them. Now the defendants afterwards took the fish, ergo the aforesaid articles were theirs. A common man, looking at this decision of the very learned judge, might possibly object to it. But ploughed up to the primary rock of the matter, the two great principles laid down in the twin whaling laws previously quoted, and applied and elucidated by Lord Ellenborough in the above-cited case, these two laws touching fast fish and loose fish, I say, will, on reflection, be found the fundamentals of all human jurisprudence, for notwithstanding its complicated tracery of sculpture, the temple of the law, like the temple of the Philistines, has but two props to stand on. Is it not a saying in everyone's mouth, possession is half of the law, that is, regardless of how the thing came into possession? But often possession is the whole of the law. What are the sinews and souls of Russian serfs and Republican slaves but fast fish, whereof possession is the whole of the law? What to the rapacious landlord is the widow's last mite but a fast fish? What is yonder undetected villain's marble mansion with a door-plate for a waif? What is that but a fast fish? What is the ruinous discount which Mordecai, the broker, gets from poor Wobegon, the bankrupt, on a loan to keep Wobegon's family from starvation? What is that ruinous discount but a fast fish? What is the Archbishop of Save Souls' income of one hundred thousand pounds, seized from the scant bread and cheese of hundreds of thousands of broken-backed laborers, all sure of heaven without any of Save Souls' help? What is that globular one hundred thousand pounds but a fast fish? What are the Duke of Dunder's hereditary towns and hamlets but fast fish? What to that redoubted harpooner John Bull is poor Ireland but a fast fish? What to that apostolic lancer brother Jonathan is Texas but a fast fish? And concerning all these is not possession the whole of the law? But if the doctrine of fast fish be pretty generally applicable, the kindred doctrine of loose fish is still more widely so. That is internationally and universally applicable. What was America in 1492 but a loose fish, in which Columbus struck the Spanish standard by way of wafing it for his royal master and mistress? What was Poland to the Tsar? What Greece to the Turk? what India to England, what at last will Mexico be to the United States, all loose fish. What are the rights of man and the liberties of the world, but loose fish? What all men's minds and opinions, but loose fish? What is the principle of religious belief in them, but a loose fish? What to the ostentatious smuggling verbalists are the thoughts of thinkers, but loose fish? What is the great globe itself but a loose fish? And what are you, reader, but a loose fish? 
and a fast fish, too. Chapter 90 Heads or Tails De baleno vero sufficit si rex habiet caput et regina caudam. Bracton, L3, C3. Latin from the books of the laws of England, which, taken along with the context, means that of all whales captured by anybody on the coast of that land, the king, as honorary grand harpooner, must have the head, and the queen be respectfully presented with the tail. A division which in the whale is much like having an apple. There is no intermediate remainder. Now, as this law, under a modified form, is to this day in force in England, and as it offers in various respects a strange anomaly touching the general law of fast and loosed fish, it is here treated of in a separate chapter, on the same courteous principle that prompts the English railways to be at the expense of a separate car, specially reserved for the accommodation of royalty. In the first place, in curious proof of the fact that the above-mentioned law is still in force, I proceed to lay before you a circumstance that happened within the last two years. It seems that some honest mariners of Dover or Sandwich or some one of the sink ports had, after a hard chase, succeeded in killing and beaching a fine whale, which they had originally described afar off from the shore, now the sink ports are partially or somehow under the jurisdiction of a sort of policeman or beadle called a lord warden holding the office directly from the crown i believe all the royal emoluments incident to the sink port territories become by assignment his by some writers this office is called a sinecure but not so, because the Lord Warden is busily employed at times in fobbing his perquisites, which are his chiefly by virtue of that same fobbing of them. Now, when these poor sunburnt mariners, barefooted and with their trousers rolled high up on their ely legs, had wearily hauled their fat fish high and dry, promising themselves a good one hundred fifty pounds from the precious oil and bone, and in fantasy sipping rare tea with their wives and good ale with their cronies upon the strength of their respective shares up steps a very learned and most christian and charitable gentleman with a copy of blackstone under his arm and laying it upon the whale's head he says hands off this fish my masters is a fast fish i seize it as the lord wardens Upon this the poor mariners, in their respectful consternation, so truly English, not knowing what to say, fall to vigorously scratching their heads all round, meanwhile ruefully glancing from the whale to the stranger. But that did no wise mend the matter, or at all soften the hard heart of the learned gentleman with the copy of Blackstone. At length one of them, after long scratching about for his ideas, made bold to speak. "'Please, sir, who is the Lord Warden?' "'The Duke.' "'But the Duke had nothing to do with taking this fish. "'It is his. "'We have been at great trouble and peril and some expense, "'and is all that to go to the Duke's benefit, "'and we get nothing at all for our pains but our blisters? "'It is his. "'Is the Duke so very poor as to be forced to this desperate mode of getting a livelihood? "'It is his.' I fought to relieve my old bedridden mother by part of my share of this whale. It is his. Won't the duke be content with a quarter or a half? It is his. In a word, the whale was seized and sold, and his grace, the Duke of Wellington, received the money. Thinking that, viewed in some particular lights, this case might, by a bare possibility, in some small degree be deemed, under the circumstances, a rather hard one, an honest clergyman of the town respectfully addressed a note to his grace, begging him to take the case of those unfortunate mariners into full consideration, to which my lord duke, in substance, replied, both letters were published, that he had already done so, and received the money, and would be obliged to the reverend gentleman, if for the future he, the reverend gentleman, would decline meddling with other people's business. 
Is this the still militant old man standing at the corners of the three kingdoms, on all hands coercing alms of beggars? It will readily be seen that in this case the alleged right of the duke to the whale was a delegated one from the sovereign. We must needs inquire then on what principle the sovereign is originally invested with that right. The law itself has already been set forth, but Plowden gives us the reason for it. Says Plowden, the whale so caught belongs to the king and queen, quote, because of its superior excellence, end quote and by the soundest commentators this has ever been held a cogent argument in such matters. But why should the king have the head and the queen the tail? A reason for that, ye lawyers. In his treatise on Queen Gold, or Queen Pin Money, an old King's Bench author, one William Prynne, thus discourseth, quote, Ye tail is ye queen's, that ye queen's wardrobe may be supplied with ye whalebone. End quote. Now this was written at a time when the black limber bone of the Greenland or right whale was largely used in ladies' bodices. But this same bone is not in the tail, it is in the head, which is a sad mistake for a sagacious lawyer like Prynne. But is the queen a mermaid to be presented with a tail? An allegorical meaning may lurk here. There are two royal fish so styled by the English law writers, the whale and the sturgeon, both royal property under certain limitations, and nominally supplying the tenth branch of the crown's ordinary revenue. I know not that any other author has hinted of the matter, but by inference it seems to me that the sturgeon must be divided in the same way as the whale, the king receiving the highly dense and elastic head peculiar to that fish, which symbolically regarded may possibly be humorously grounded upon some presumed congeniality. And thus there seems a reason in all things, even in law. Chapter 91. The Pequod Meets the Rosebud. Quote, in vain it was to rake for ambergris in the paunch of this leviathan, insufferable fetter denying not inquiry. End quote. Sir T. Brown, V. E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory, midday sea, that the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft, a peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. "'I will bet something now,' said Stubb, "'that somewhere hereabouts are some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long.' Presently the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betoken that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture sea-fowl that circled and hovered and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale. That is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse." It may well be conceived what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague, when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some, that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality, and by no means of the nature of attar of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in its proper place, we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general." 
The Pequod had now swept so nigh to the stranger that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. "'There's a pretty fellow now,' he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows. "'There's a jackal for thee. I well know that these crappos of Frenchmen are but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm-whale spouts.' "'Yes, and sometimes sailing from their ports with their hold full of boxes of tallow candles, and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into. Aye, we all know these things. But look ye, here's a crapo that is content with our leavings. The drugged whale there, I mean. Aye, and is content, too, with scraping the dry bones of that other precious fish she has there. Poor devil!' I say, pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear Charity's sake. For what oil he will get from that drugged whale there, wouldn't be fit to burn in a jail? No, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours than he'll get from that bundle of bones. Though, now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil." Yes, ambergris. I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it. And so saying, he started for the quarter-deck. By this time the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew, and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that, in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem-piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red colour, Upon her headboards, in large gilt letters, he read, Bouton de Rose, Rose Button, or Rose Bud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Bouton part of the inscription, yet the word Rose and the bulbous figurehead put together sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rose bud, eh? he cried with his hand to his nose. That will do very well. But how like all creation it smells! Now, in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side, and thus come close to the blasted whale, and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, uh, Bouton de Rose, ahoy! Are there any of you uh, Bouton de Roses that speak English? Yes! rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well then, uh, my Bouton de Rosebud, uh, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale. A sperm whale, Moby Dick. Have you seen him? Never heard of such a whale. Cachelot Blanche? White whale? No. Uh, very good then. Uh, good-bye now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod, and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarter-deck rail, awaiting his report, he moulded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, "'No, sir, no!' Upon which Ahab retired, and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just got into the chains, and was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. "'What's the matter with your nose there?' said Stubb. "'Broke it?' "'I wish it were broken, or that I didn't have any nose at all,' answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. "'But what are you holding yours for?' "'Oh, uh, nothing. It's a wax nose. I have to hold it on. A fine day, ain't it? Air rather gardeny, I should say. Throw us a bunch of posies, will you, uh, Bouton de Rose?' "'What in the devil's name do you want here?' roared the Guernseyman, flying into a sudden passion. "'Oh, uh, keep cool. 
cool yes that's the word uh, why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at em but uh, joking aside though do you know uh, rosebud that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales as for that dried up one there he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass i know that well enough but do you see the captain here won't believe it this is his first voyage he was a cologne manufacturer before but come aboard and mayhap he'll believe you if he won't me and so i'll get out of this dirty scrape anything to oblige you my sweet and pleasant fellow rejoined stubb and with that he soon mounted to the deck there a queer scene presented itself the sailors in tasseled caps of red worsted were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales but they worked rather slow and talked very fast and seemed in anything but a good humour all their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib booms now and then pairs of them would drop their work and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air some thinking they would catch the plague dipped oakum in coal tar and at intervals held it to their nostrils others having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke so that it constantly filled their olfactories stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door which was held ajar from within this was the tormented surgeon who after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day had betaken himself to the captain's roundhouse cabinet he called it to avoid the pest but still could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times marking all this stubb argued well for his scheme and turning to the guernseyman had a little chat with him during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle sounding him carefully stubb further perceived that the guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris he therefore held his peace on that head but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity according to this little plan of theirs the guernsey man under cover of an interpreter's office was to tell the captain what he pleased but as coming from stubb and as for stubb he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview by this time their destined victim appeared from his cabin he was a small and dark but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain with large whiskers and moustache however and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side to this gentleman stubb was now politely introduced by the guernsey man who at once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them what shall i say to him first said he why said stubb eyeing the velvet vest and watch and seals you may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babyish to me though i don't pretend to be a judge he says monsieur said the guernseyman in french turning to his captain that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel whose captain and chief mate with six sailors had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside upon this the captain started and eagerly desired to know more what now said the guernsey man to stubb why since he takes it so easy tell him that now i have eyed him carefully i am quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale-ship than a st jago monkey in fact tell him from me he's a baboon he vows and declares monsieur that the other whale the dried one is far more deadly than the blasted one in fine monsieur he conjures us as we value our lives to cut loose from these fish instantly the captain ran forward and in a loud voice commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles and at once cast loose the cables and chains confining the whales to the ship what now said the guernsey man when the captain had returned to them oh, why let me see yes 
you may as well tell him uh, now that uh, that in fact tell him i've diddled him and aside to himself perhaps somebody else he says monsieur that he's very happy to have been of any service to us hearing this the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties meaning himself and mate and concluded by inviting stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of bordeaux he wants you to take a glass of wine with him said the interpreter oh, thank him heartily but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man i've diddled in fact tell him i must go he says monsieur that his principles won't admit of his drinking but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink then monsieur had best drop all four boats and pull the ship away from these whales for it's so calm they won't drift by this time stubb was over the side and getting into his boat hailed the guernsey man to this effect that having a long tow-line in his boat he would do what he could to help them by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side while the frenchman's boats then were engaged in towing the ship one way stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long tow-line presently a breeze sprang up stubb feigned to cast off from the whale hoisting his boats the frenchman soon increased his distance while the pequod slid in between him and stubb's whale whereupon stubb quickly pulled to the floating body and hailing the pequod to give notice of his intentions at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning seizing his sharp boat spade he commenced an excavation in the body a little behind the side fin you would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs it was like turning up old roman tiles and pottery buried in fat english loam his boat's crew were all in high excitement eagerly helping their chief and looking as anxious as gold hunters and all the time numberless fowls were diving and ducking and screaming and yelling and fighting around them stubb was beginning to look disappointed especially as the horrible nosegay increased when suddenly from out the very heart of this plague there stole a faint stream of perfume which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it as one river will flow into and then along with another without at all blending with it for a time i have it i have it cried stubb with delight striking something in the subterranean regions a purse a purse dropping his spade he thrust both hands in and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe windsor soap or rich mottled old cheese very unctuous and savoury withal you might easily dent it with your thumb it is of a hue between yellow and ash colour and this good friends is ambergris worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist some six handfuls were obtained but more was unavoidably lost in the sea and still more perhaps might have been secured were it not for impatient ahab's loud command to stubb to desist and come on board else the ship would bid them good-bye end of chapters eighty nine to ninety one moby dick by Herman Melville, chapters ninety two to ninety six. Chapter ninety two Ambergris. Now, this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce that in seventeen ninety one a certain Nantucket born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on the subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but a French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the sea coast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea besides amber is a hard transparent brittle odourless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes for beads and ornaments 
but ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in pastilles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking, and also carry it to Mecca for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect, of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of brandreth pills, and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first Stubb thought might be sailors' trousers' buttons, but afterwards it turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner. Now, that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay, is this nothing? Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor but raised in glory, and likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that maketh the best musk, also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savour, cologne water in its rudimental manufacturing stages is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which, in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved, that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly, untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London, more than two centuries ago, because those whalemen did not then, and do not now, try out their oil at sea, as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber into small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks, and carry it home in that manner, the shortness of the season in those icy seas, and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is, that upon breaking into the hold, and unloading one of these whale cemeteries in the Greenland dock, a savour is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard for the foundations of a lying-in hospital." I partly surmise also that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland in former times of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smeerenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports, smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out, without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat kettles, and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation certainly gave forth no very pleasant savor. But all this is quite different with a South Sea sperm whaler, which, in a voyage of four years, perhaps, after completely filling her hold with oil, does not, perhaps, consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and, in the state that it is casked, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is that, living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odor, nor can whalemen be recognized as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company by the nose. Nor, indeed, can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant, when, as a general thing, he enjoys such high health. 
taking abundance of exercise, always out of doors, though it is true seldom in the open air. I say that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlour. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant with jewelled tusks, and redolent with myrrh, which was led out of an Indian town to do honour to Alexander the Great? Chapter 93 The Castaway It was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever-accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale-ship it is not every one that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved called ship-keepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these ship-keepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boat's crew. But if there happens to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a ship-keeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little negro Pippin, by nickname, Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip! You have heard of him before. You must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight, so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over-tender-hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe a tribe which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks the year's calendar should show naught but three hundred and sixty-five Fourth of Julys and New Year's Days. Nor smile so while I write that this little black was brilliant, for even blackness has its brilliancy, behold yon lustrous ebony, panelled in king's cabinets." But Pip loved life and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped had most sadly blurred his brightness, though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him in the end was destined to be luridly illuminated by strange wild fires that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which in his native Tallinn County in Connecticut he had once enlivened many a fiddler's frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide with his gay ha-ha had turned the round horizon into one star-belled tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue-veined neck, the pure-watered diamond drop will healthful glow, yet when the cunning jeweller would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb, then the evil blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewel stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass that in the Ambergris affair Stubbs after oarsman chanced so to sprain his hand as for a time to become quite maimed, and temporarily Pip was put in his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily for that time escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb, observing him, took care afterwards to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now, upon the second lowering, the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap which happened in this instance to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, 
and in such a way that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him so as to become entangled in it, when at last plumping into the water. That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto, poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtego stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line, and turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut! Meantime, Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, Do, for God's sake! All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. "'Damn him, cut!' roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost, and Pip was saved. So soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. Tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, business-like, but still half-humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except, but all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat is your true motto in whaling. But cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice and concluded with a peremptory command, "'Stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord I won't pick you up if you jump, mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you. A whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind.' and don't jump any more. Hereby, perhaps, Stubb indirectly hinted that, though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence, when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveller's trunk. Alas, Stubb was but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool, and flatly stretching away, all round to the horizon, like gold-beater's skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves, no boat-knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubb's inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out of the centre of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practised swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore, but the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God, who can tell it? Mark how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea, mark how closely they hug their ship, and only coast along her sides." But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least, because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed, no doubt, that they would, of course, come up to Pip very quickly, and pick him up, though, indeed, such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur, Almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned and gave chase. 
and Stubb's boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon the fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such at least they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though, rather carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, God-omnipresent, coral insects that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom, and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought, which to reason is absurd and frantic and weal or woe feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. CHAPTER 94 A SQUEEZE OF THE HAND that whale of Stubbs, so dearly purchased, was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg tun, or case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs so soon as filled with the sperm, and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the triworks, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree that when, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps, here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. A sweet and unctuous duty! No wonder that in old times this sperm was such a favorite cosmetic, such a clearer, such a sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence, like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, literally and truly like the smell of spring violets. I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow. I forgot all about our horrible oath. In that inexpressible sperm I washed my hands and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill-will, or petulance, or malice, of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, 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 all the morning long I squeezed that sperm, till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands, and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill-humor or envy? 
Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged, repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases man must eventually lower, or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing on sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the tri-works. First comes white horse, so called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish, and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs, ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber, and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich, mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground, dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. I confess that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe. It is called slob gallion, an appellation original with the whaleman, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Glurry, so called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. Nippers. Strictly this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is the short, firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of the leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgee, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room, and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pike and gaffman and a spademan. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat-hook. 
With his gaff, the gaffman hooks on to a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spade man stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. This spade is sharp as hone can make it. The spademan's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes, or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber-room men. Chapter 95 The Cassock had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this post-mortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange enigmatical object, which you would have seen there lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers. Not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, and jet-black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol indeed it is, or rather in old times its likeness was, such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which King Asa her son did depose her, and destroyed the idol, and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor called the Mincer, who now comes along, and, assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter the pelt of a boa. This done, he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching so as almost to double its diameter, and at last hangs it well spread to the rigging to dry. Ere long it is taken down, when removing some three feet of it towards the pointed extremity, and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him while employed in the peculiar functions of his office. That office consists in mincing the horse pieces of blubber for the pots, an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse, planted endwise against the bulwarks, and with a capacious tub beneath it, into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a rapt orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves, what a candidate for an archbishopric! What a lad for a pope were this mincer. Footnote. Bible leaves! Bible leaves! This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as, by so doing, the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality. End of footnote. Chapter 96. The Triworks. Besides her hoisted boats, an American whaler is outwardly distinguished by her triworks. She presents the curious anomaly of the most solid masonry joining with oak and hemp in constituting the completed ship. It is as if from the open field a brick kiln were transported to her planks. The triworks are planted between the foremast and the mainmast, the most roomy part of the deck. The timbers beneath are of a peculiar strength, fitted to sustain the weight of an almost solid mass of brick and mortar some ten feet by eight square, and five in height. 
the foundation does not penetrate the deck but the masonry is firmly secured to the surface by ponderous knees of iron bracing it on all sides and screwing it down to the timbers on the flanks it is cased with wood and at top completely covered by a large sloping battened hatchway removing this hatch we expose the great tripods two in number and each of several barrels capacity when not in use they are kept remarkably clean sometimes they are polished with soapstone and sand till they shine within like silver punch bowls during the night watches some cynical old sailors will crawl into them and coil themselves away there for a nap while employed in polishing them one man in each pot side by side many confidential communications are carried on over the iron lips it is a place also for profound mathematical meditation it was in the left-hand tripod of the pequod with the soapstone diligently circling round me that i was first indirectly struck by the remarkable fact that in geometry all bodies gliding along the cycloid my soapstone for example will descend from any point in precisely the same time removing the fireboard from the front of the triworks the bare masonry of that side is exposed penetrated by the two iron mouths of the furnaces directly underneath the pots these mouths are fitted with heavy doors of iron the intense heat of the fire is prevented from communicating itself to the deck by means of a shallow reservoir extending under the entire enclosed surface of the works by a tunnel inserted at the rear this reservoir is kept replenished with water as fast as it evaporates there are no external chimneys they open direct from the rear wall and here let us go back for a moment it was about nine o'clock at night that the pequod's triworks were first started on this present voyage it belonged to stubb to oversee the business all ready there off hatch then and starter you cook fire the works this was an easy thing for the carpenter had been thrusting his shavings into the furnace throughout the passage here be it said that in a whaling voyage the first fire in the triworks has to be fed for a time with wood after that no wood is used except as a means of quick ignition to the staple fuel in a word after being tried out the crisp shrivelled blubber now called scraps or fritters still contains considerable of its unctuous properties these fritters feed the flames like a plethoric burning martyr or self-consuming misanthrope once ignited the whale supplies his own fuel and burns by his own body would that he consumed his own smoke for his smoke is horrible to inhale and inhale it you must and not only that but you must live in it for the time it has an unspeakable wild hindu odour about it such as may lurk in the vicinity of funeral pyres it smells like the left wing of the day of judgment it is an argument for the pit by midnight the works were in full operation we were clear from the carcass sail had been made the wind was freshening the wild ocean darkness was intense but that darkness was licked up by the fierce flames which at intervals forked forth from the sooty flues and illuminated every lofty rope in the rigging as with the famed greek fire the burning ship drove on as if remorselessly commissioned to some vengeful deed so the pitch and sulphur freighted brigs of the bold hydriote canaris issuing from their midnight harbours with broad sheets of flame for sails bore down upon the turkish frigates and folded them in conflagrations the hatch removed from the top of the works now afforded a wide hearth in front of them standing on this were the tartarian shapes of the pagan harpooners always the whale-ship's stokers with huge pronged poles they pitched hissing masses of blubber into the scalding pots or stirred up the fires beneath till the snaky flames darted curling out of the doors to catch them by the feet the smoke rolled away in sullen heaps to every pitch of the ship there was a pitch of the boiling oil which seemed all eagerness to leap into their faces opposite the mouth of the works on the further side of the wide wooden hearth was the windlass this served for a sea sofa 
Here lounged the watch, when not otherwise employed, looking into the red heat of the fire till our eyes felt scorched in their heads. Their tawny features, now all begrimed with smoke and sweat, their matted beards, and the contrasting barbaric brilliancy of their teeth, all these were strangely revealed in the capricious emblazonings of the works. As they narrated to each other their unholy adventures, their tales of terror told in words of mirth, as their uncivilized laughter forked upwards out of them, like the flames from the furnace, as to and fro in their front the harpooners wildly gesticulated with their huge pronged forks and dippers, as the wind howled on and the sea leaped and the ship groaned and dived, and yet steadfastly shot her red hell further and further into the blackness of the sea and the night, and scornfully champed the white bone in her mouth, and viciously spat round her on all sides, then the rushing Pequod, freighted with savages, and laden with fire, and burning a corpse, and plunging into that blackness of darkness, seemed the material counterpart of her monomaniac commander's soul. So seemed it to me, as I stood at her helm, and for long hours silently guided the way of this fire-ship on the sea. Wrapped for that interval in darkness myself, I but the better saw the redness, the madness, the ghastliness of others. The continual sight of the fiend shapes before me, capering half in smoke and half in fire, these at last begat kindred visions in my soul, so soon as I began to yield to that unaccountable drowsiness which ever would come over me at a midnight helm. But that night in particular a strange and ever since inexplicable thing occurred to me, Starting from a brief standing sleep, I was horribly conscious of something fatally wrong. The jawbone tiller smote my side, which leaned against it. In my ears was the low hum of sails, just beginning to shake in the wind. I thought my eyes were open. I was half conscious of putting my fingers to the lids, and mechanically stretching them still further apart. But spite of all this, I could see no compass before me to steer by though it seemed but a minute since I had been watching the card, by the steady binnacle lamp illuminating it. Nothing seemed before me but a jet gloom, now and then made ghastly by flashes of redness. Uppermost was the impression that whatever swift rushing thing I stood on was not so much bound to any haven ahead as rushing from all havens astern. A stark, bewildered feeling as of death came over me, Convulsively my hands grasped the tiller, but with the crazy conceit that the tiller was, somehow, in some enchanted way, inverted. My God, what is the matter with me, I thought. Lo, in my brief sleep I had turned myself about, and was fronting the ship's stern, with my back to her prow and the compass. In an instant I faced back, just in time to prevent the vessel from flying up into the wind, and very probably capsizing her. How glad and how grateful the relief from this unnatural hallucination of the night, and the fatal contingency of being brought by the lee. Look not too long in the face of fire, O oh man. Never dream with thy hand on the helm. Turn not thy back to the compass. Accept the first hint of the hitching tiller. Believe not the artificial fire, when its redness makes all things look ghastly. Tomorrow, in the natural sun, the skies will be bright. Those who glared like devils in the forking flames, the morn will show in far other, at least gentler, relief. The glorious, golden, glad sun, the only true lamp, all others but liars. Nevertheless, the sun hides not Virginia's dismal swamp, nor Rome's accursed Campagna, nor wide Sahara, nor all the millions of miles of deserts and of griefs beneath the moon. The sun hides not the ocean which is the dark side of this earth, and which is two-thirds of this earth. So, therefore, that mortal man who hath more of joy than sorrow in him, that mortal man cannot be true, not true or undeveloped. With books the same, the truest of all men was the man of sorrows, and the truest of all books is Solomon's, and Ecclesiastes is the fine-hammered steel of woe. All is vanity. 
all. This willful world hath not got hold of unchristian Solomon's wisdom yet. But he who dodges hospitals and jails, and walks fast crossing graveyards, and would rather talk of operas than hell, calls Cowper, Young, Pascal, Rousseau, poor devils all of sick men, and throughout a carefree lifetime swears by Rabelais as passing wise and therefore jolly, not that man is fitted to sit down on tombstones and break the green damp mould with unfathomably wondrous Solomon. But even Solomon, he says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain, i.e., even while living, in the congregation of the dead. Give not thyself up, then, to fire, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges, and soar out of them again, and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if he forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop the mountain eagle is still higher than other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. End of chapters 92 to 96 Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 97 to 100 Chapter 97 the Lamp Had you descended from the Pequod's triworks to the Pequod's forecastle, where the off-duty watch were sleeping, for one single moment you would have almost thought you were standing in some illuminated shrine of canonized kings and counselors. There they lay in their triangular oaken vaults, each mariner a chiseled muteness, a score of lamps flashing upon his hooded eyes. In merchantmen, oil for the sailor is more scarce than the milk of queens. To dress in the dark, to eat in the dark, and stumble in darkness to his pallet, this is his usual lot. But the whaleman, as he seeks the food of light, so he lives in light. He makes his berth an Aladdin's lamp, and lays him down to it, so that in the pitchous night the ship's black hull still houses an illumination. See with what entire freedom the whaleman takes his handful of lamps, often but old bottles and vials, though, to the copper cooler at the triworks, and replenishes them there, as mugs of ale at a vat. He burns, too, the purest of oils, in its unmanufactured and therefore unvitiated state, a fluid unknown to solar, lunar, or astral contrivances ashore, it is as sweet as early grass butter in April. He goes and hunts for his oil, so as to be sure of its freshness and genuineness, even as the traveller on the prairie hunts up his own supper of game. Chapter 98 Stowing Down and Clearing Up Already it has been related how the great Leviathan is afar off descried from the masthead, how he is chased over the watery moors, and slaughtered in the valleys of the deep, how he is then towed alongside and beheaded, and how, on the principle which entitled the headsman of old to the garments in which the beheaded was killed, his great padded surtout becomes the property of his executioner, how in due time he is condemned to the pots, and like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his spermaceti, oil, and bone pass unscathed through the fire. But now it remains to conclude the last chapter of this part of the description by rehearsing, singing if I may, the romantic proceeding of decanting off his oil into the casks and striking them down into the hold, where once again Leviathan returns to his native profundities, sliding along beneath the surface as before, but, alas, never more to rise and blow. While still warm, the oil, like hot punch, is received into the six-barrel casks, and while, perhaps, the ship is pitching and rolling this way and that in the midnight sea, the enormous casks are slewed round and headed over, end for end, and sometimes perilously scoot across the slippery deck, like so many landslides, 
till at last man handled and stayed in their course and all round the hoops rap rap go as many hammers as can play upon them for now ex officio every sailor is a cooper at length when the last pint is casked and all is cool then the great hatchways are unsealed the bowels of the ship are thrown open and down go the casks to their final rest in the sea this done the hatches are replaced and hermetically closed like a closet walled up in the sperm fishery this is perhaps one of the most remarkable incidents in all the business of whaling one day the planks stream with freshets of blood and oil on the sacred quarter-deck enormous masses of the whale's head are profanely piled great rusty casks lie about as in a brewery yard the smoke from the triworks is besooted all the bulwarks the mariners go about suffused with unctuousness the entire ship seems great leviathan himself while on all hands the din is deafening but a day or two after you look about you and prick your ears in this self-same ship and were it not for the tell-tale boats and triworks you would all but swear you trod some silent merchant vessel with a most scrupulously neat commander the unmanufactured sperm oil possesses a singularly cleansing virtue this is the reason why the decks never look so white as just after what they call an affair of oil besides from the ashes of the burned scraps of the whale a potent lie is readily made and whenever any adhesiveness from the back of the whale remains clinging to the side that lie quickly exterminates it hands go diligently along the bulwarks and with buckets of water and rags to restore them to their full tidiness the soot is brushed from the lower rigging all the numerous implements which have been in use are likewise faithfully cleansed and put away the great hatch is scrubbed and placed upon the triworks completely hiding the pots every cask is out of sight all tackles are coiled in unseen nooks and when by the combined and simultaneous industry of almost the entire ship's company the whole of this conscientious duty is at last concluded then the crew themselves proceed to their own ablutions shift themselves from top to toe and finally issue to the immaculate deck fresh and all aglow as bridegroom new leaped from out of the daintiest holland now with elated step they pace the planks in twos and threes and humorously discourse of parlors sofas carpets and fine cambrics propose to mat the deck think of having hanging to the top object not to taking tea by moonlight on the piazza of the forecastle to hint to such musked mariners of oil and bone and blubber were little short of audacity they know not the thing you distantly allude to away and bring us napkins but mark aloft there at the three mastheads stand three men intent on spying out more whales which if caught infallibly will again soil the old oaken furniture and drop at least one small grease spot somewhere yes and many is the time when after the severest uninterrupted labors which know no night continuing straight through for ninety-six hours when from the boat where they have swelled their wrists with all day rowing on the line they only step to the deck to carry vast chains and heave the heavy windlass and cut and slash yea and in their very sweatings to be smoked and burned anew by the combined fires of the equatorial sun and the equatorial triworks when on the heels of all this they have finally bestirred themselves to cleanse the ship and make a spotless dairy room of it many is the time the poor fellows just buttoning the necks of their clean frocks are startled by the cry of there she blows and away they fly to fight another whale and go through the whole weary thing again oh my friends but this is man-killing yet this is life for hardly have we mortals by long toilings extracted from this world's vast bulk its small but valuable sperm and then with weary patience cleansed ourselves from its defilements and learned to live here in clean tabernacles of the soul hardly is this done when there she blows the ghost is spouted up and away we sail to fight some other world and go through young life's old routine again
Oh, the metempsychosis! Oh, Pythagoras, that in bright Greece two thousand years ago did die, so good, so wise, so mild! I sailed with thee along the Peruvian coast last voyage, and, foolish as I am, taught thee, a green, simple boy, how to splice a rope. Chapter 99 The Doubloon Ere now it has been related how Ahab was wont to pace his quarter-deck, taking regular turns at either limit, the binnacle and mainmast, but in the multiplicity of other things requiring narration it has not been added how that sometimes in these walks, when most plunged in his mood, he was wont to pause in turn at each spot, and stand there strangely eyeing the particular object before him. When he halted before the binnacle, with his glance fastened on the pointed needle in the compass, that glance shot like a javelin with the pointed intensity of his purpose. And when resuming his walk, he again paused before the mainmast, then, as the same riveted glance fastened upon the riveted gold coin there, he still wore the same aspect of nailed firmness, only dashed with a certain wild longing, if not hopefulness. But one morning, turning to pass the doubloon, he seemed to be newly attracted by these strange figures and inscriptions stamped on it, as though now, for the first time, beginning to interpret for himself, in some monomaniac way, whatever significance might lurk in them. And some certain significance lurks in all things, else all things are little worth, and the round world itself but an empty cipher, except to sell by the cartload as they do hills about Boston, to fill up some morass in the Milky Way. Now this doubloon was of purest virgin gold, raked somewhere out of the heart of gorgeous hills, whence east and west over golden sands the headwaters of many a Pactolus flows, and though now nailed amidst all the rustiness of iron bolts and the verdigris of copper spikes, yet untouchable and immaculate to any foulness, it still preserved its Quito glow, nor though placed amongst a ruthless crew and every hour passed by ruthless hands, and through the live-long nights shrouded with thick darkness which might cover any pilfering approach, nevertheless every sunrise found the doubloon where sunset left at last, for it was set apart and sanctified to one awe-striking end, and however wanton in their sailor ways, one and all, the mariners revered it as the white whale's talisman. Sometimes they talked it over in the weary watch by night, wondering whose it was to be at last and whether he would ever live to spend it. Now those noble golden coins of South America are as medals of the sun and tropic token pieces. Here palms, alpacas, and volcanoes, suns, discs, and stars, ecliptics, horns of plenty, and rich banners waving are in luxuriant profusion stamped, so that the precious gold seems almost to derive an added preciousness and enhancing glories by passing through those fancy mints, so Spanishly poetic. It so chanced that the doubloon of the Pequod was a most wealthy example of these things. On its round border it bore the letters, República del Ecuador, Quito. So this bright coin came from a country planted in the middle of the world, and beneath the great equator, and named after it, and it had been cast midway up the Andes, in the unwaning clime that knows no autumn. Zoned by those letters you saw the likeness of three Andes summits, from one a flame, a tower on another, on the third a crowing cock, while arching over all was a segment of the partitioned zodiac, the signs all marked with their usual cabalistics, and the keystone sun entering the equinoctial point at Libra. Before this equatorial coin, Ahab, not unobserved by others, was now pausing. There's something ever egotistical in mountain tops and towers, and all other grand and lofty things. Look here, three peaks as proud as Lucifer. The firm tower, that is Ahab. The volcano, that is Ahab. The courageous, the undaunted, and victorious fowl, that too is Ahab. All are Ahab. 
and this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which, like the magician's glass, to each and every man in turn but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Great pains, small gains for those who ask the world to solve them. It cannot solve itself. Methinks now this coined sun wears a ruddy face. But see, ay, he enters the sign of storms, the equinox. And but six months before he wheeled out of a former equinox at Aries. From storm to storm, so be it then. Born in throes, it is fit that man should live in pains and die in pangs. So be it then. Here's stout stuff for woe to work on. So be it then. No fairy fingers can have pressed the gold, but the devil's claws must have left their mouldings there since yesterday, murmured Starbuck to himself, leaning against the bulwarks. The old man seems to read Belshazzar's awful writing. I have never marked the coin inspectingly. He goes below. Let me read. A dark valley between three mighty heaven-abiding peaks that almost seem the trinity in some faint earthly symbol. So in this veil of death God girds us round, and over all our gloom the sun of righteousness still shines a beacon and a hope. If we bend down our eyes, the dark veil shows her mouldy soil, but if we lift them, the bright sun meets our glance halfway to cheer. Yet, oh, the great sun is no fixture. And if, at midnight, we would fain snatch some sweet solace from him, we gaze for him in vain. This coin speaks wisely, mildly, truly, but still sadly to me. I will quit it, lest truth shake me falsely. There now's the old mogul, soliloquized Stubb by the triworks. He's been twigging it, and there goes Starbuck from the same, and both with faces which I should say might be somewhere within nine fathoms long, and all from looking at a piece of gold, which did I have it now on Negro Hill or in Corlier's Hook, I'd not look at it very long ere spending it. Humph! In my poor, insignificant opinion, I regard this as queer. I have seen doubloons before now in my voyagings, your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Papillon, with plenty of gold moderets and pistoles, and joes and half-joes and quarter-joes. What should there then be in this doubloon of the equator that is so killing wonderful? By Golconda, let me read it once. Hello! Here's signs and wonders truly. That now is what old Bowditch in his epitome calls the Zodiac, and what my almanac below calls Ditto. I'll get the almanac, and as I have heard devils can be raised with Dabol's arithmetic, I'll try my hand at raising a meaning out of these queer curvicues here with the Massachusetts calendar. Here's the book. Let's see now. Signs and wonders, and the sun, he's always among em. Hem, hem, hem. Here they are. Here they go. All alive. Aries, or the ram. Taurus, or the bull. And Jiminy. Here's Gemini himself, or the twins. Well, the sun, he wheels among em. Aye, here on the coin, he's just crossing the threshold, between two of the twelve sitting-rooms, all in a ring. Book. You lie there. The fact is, you books must know your places. You do to give us the bare words and facts, but we come in to supply the thoughts. That's my small experience, so far as the Massachusetts calendar and Bowditch's navigator and de Bull's arithmetic go. Signs and wonders, eh? Pity if there is nothing wonderful in signs and significant in wonders. There's a clue somewhere. Wait a bit. Hist! Hark! By Jove! I have it. Look you, doubloon, your zodiac here is the life of man in one round chapter, and now I'll read it off straight out of the book. Come, almanac. To begin, there's Ares, or the ram, lecherous dog, he begets us. Then Taurus, or the bull, he bumps us the first thing. Then Gemini, or the twins, that is, virtue and vice, we try to reach virtue. 
when lo comes cancer the crab and drags us back and here going from virtue leo a roaring lion lies in the path he gives a few fierce bites and surly dabs with his paw we escape and hail virgo the virgin that's our first love we marry and think to be happy for i when pop comes libra or the scales happiness weighed and found wanting and while we are very sad about that lord how we suddenly jump as scorpio or the scorpion stings us in the rear we are curing the wound when wang come the arrows all around sagittarius or the archer is amusing himself as we pluck out the shafts stand aside here's the battering ram capricornus or the goat full tilt he comes rushing and headlong we are tossed when aquarius or the water-bearer pours out his whole deluge and drowns us and to wind up with pisces or the fishes we sleep there's a sermon now writ in high heaven and the sun goes through it every year and yet comes out of it all alive and hearty jollily he aloft there wheels through toil and trouble and so alo here does jolly stub ah jolly's the word for i adieu doubloon but stop here comes little king post dodge round the triworks now and let's hear what he'll have to say there he's before it he'll out with something presently so so he's beginning i see nothing here but a round thing made of gold and whoever raises a certain whale this round thing belongs to him so what's all this staring been about it is worth sixteen dollars that's true and at two cents the cigar that's uh, nine hundred and sixty cigars i won't smoke dirty pipes like stubb but i like cigars and here's nine hundred and sixty of them so here goes flask aloft to spy em out shall i call that wise or foolish now if it be really wise it has a foolish look to it yet if it be really foolish then it has a sort of wiseish look to it but if asked here comes our old manxman the old hearse driver he must have been that is before he took to the sea he luffs up before the doubloon hello and goes round the other side of the mast why there's a horseshoe nailed on that side and now he's back again what does that mean hark he's muttering voice like an old worn-out coffee-mill prick ears and listen if the white whale be raised it must be in a month and a day when the sun stands in some one of these signs i've studied signs and know their marks they were taught me two score years ago by an old witch in copenhagen now in what sign will the sun then be the horseshoe sign for there it is right opposite the gold and what's the horseshoe sign the lion is the horseshoe sign the roaring and devouring lion ship old ship my old head shakes to think of thee ah, there's another rendering now but still one text all sorts of men in one kind of world you see dodge again here comes queequeg all tattooing looks like the signs of the zodiac himself what says the cannibal as i live he's comparing notes looking at his thigh bone thinks the sun is in the thigh or in the calf or in the bowels i suppose as the old women talk surgeon's astronomy in the back country and by jove he's found something there in the vicinity of his thigh i guess it's sagittarius or the archer no he don't know what to make of the doubloon he takes it for an old button off some king's trousers but aside again here comes that ghost devil fadala tail coiled out of sight as usual oakum in the toes of his pumps as usual what does he say with that look of his ah only makes a sign to the sign and bows himself there is a sun on the coin fire worshipper depend upon it ho oh, more and more this way comes pip poor boy would he had died or i he's half horrible to me he too has been watching all these interpreters myself included and look now he comes to read with that unearthly idiot face stand away again and hear him hark i look you look he looks 
We look, ye look, they look. Upon my soul, he's been studying Murray's grammar, improving his mind, poor fellow. But what's that he says now? Hist! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Why, he's getting it by heart. Hist! Again! I look, you look, he looks, we look, ye look, they look. Well, that's funny. And I, you, and he, and we, ye, and they, are all bats, and I'm a crow, especially when I stand atop of this pine tree here. Caw, 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 ain't I a crow? And where's the scarecrow? There he stands, two bones stuck into a pair of old trousers, and two more poked into the sleeves of an old jacket. Wonder if he means me. Complimentary. Poor lad. I could go and hang myself. Anyway, for the present, I'll quit Pip's vicinity. I can stand the rest, for they have plain wits, but he's too crazy witty for my sanity. So, so, I leave him muttering. Here's the ship's navel, this doubloon here, and they are all on fire to unscrew it. But unscrew your navel, and what's the consequence? Then again, if it stays here, that is ugly, too, for when aught's nailed to the mast, it's a sign that things grow desperate. Ha! Ha! Old Ahab, the white whale, he'll nail you. This is a pine tree. My father, in old Tallinn County, cut down a pine tree once, and found a silver ring grown over in it, some old darkie's wedding ring. How did it get there? And so they'll say in the resurrection, when they come to fish up this old mast, and find a doubloon lodged in it, with bedded oysters for the shaggy bark. Ah, oh, the gold! The precious, precious gold! The green miser'll hoard you soon. Hish! Hish! God goes mong the worlds blackberrying. Cook! Ho! Cook! And cook us! Jenny! Hey! 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 Jenny! Jenny! And get your hoe-cake done! Chapter 100 Leg and Arm The Pequod of Nantucket Meets the Samuel Enderby of London Ship ahoy! Has seen the white whale! So cried Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter-boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of sixty or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung round him in festoons of blue pilot-cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. "'Has seen the white whale! See you this!' And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up a white arm of sperm-whale bone, terminating in a wooden head like a mallet. "'Man my boat!' cried Ahab, impetuously, and tossing about the oars near him. "'Stand by to lower!' In less than a minute, without quitting his little craft, he and his crew were dropped to the water, and were soon alongside of the stranger. But here a curious difficulty presented itself. In the excitement of the moment Ahab had forgotten that since the loss of his leg he had never once stepped on board of any vessel at sea but his own, and then it was always by an ingenious and very handy mechanical contrivance peculiar to the Pequod, and a thing not to be rigged and shipped in any other vessel at a moment's warning. Now it is no very easy matter for anybody, except those who are almost hourly used to it like whalemen, to clamber up a ship's side from a boat on the open sea, for the great swells now lift the boat high up toward the bulwarks, then instantaneously drop it halfway down to the kelson. So, deprived of one leg, and the strange ship of course being altogether unsupplied with the kindly invention, Ahab now found himself abjectly reduced to a clumsy landsman again, hopelessly eyeing the uncertain changeful height he could hardly hope to attain. 
It has before been hinted, perhaps, that every little untoward circumstance that befell him, and which indirectly sprang from his luckless mishap, almost invariably irritated or exasperated Ahab. And in the present instance, all this was heightened by the sight of the two officers of the strange ship, leaning over the side, by the perpendicular ladder of nailed cleats there, and swinging towards him a pair of tastefully ornamented man-ropes. For at first they did not seem to bethink them that a one-legged man must be too much of a cripple to use their sea banisters. But this awkwardness only lasted a minute, because the strange captain, observing at a glance how affairs stood, cried out, I see, I see, a vast heaving there. Jump, boys, and swing over the cutting tackle. As good luck would have it, they had had a whale alongside a day or two previous, and the great tackles were still aloft, and the massive curved blubber hook, now clean and dry, was still attached to the end. This was quickly lowered to Ahab, who, at once comprehending it all, slid his solitary thigh into the curve of the hook, it was like sitting in the fluke of an anchor or the crotch of an apple tree, and then giving the word held himself fast, and at the same time also helped to hoist his own weight by pulling hand over hand upon one of the running parts of the tackle. Soon he was carefully swung inside the high bulwarks and gently landed upon the capstan head. With his ivory arm frankly thrust forth and welcome, the other captain advanced, and Ahab, putting out his ivory leg, and crossing the ivory arm like two swordfish blades, cried out in his walrus way, Aye, aye, hearty, let us shake bones together, an arm and a leg, an arm that never can shrink, do you see, and a leg that never can run. Where didst thou see the white whale? How long ago? The white whale, said the Englishman, pointing his ivory arm towards the east, and taking a rueful sight along it, as if it had been a telescope. There I saw him, on the line last season. And he took that arm off, did he? asked Ahab, now sliding down from the capstan, and resting on the Englishman's shoulder as he did so. Aye, he was the cause of it at least. And that leg, too? Spin me the yarn, said Ahab. How was it? "'It was the first time in my life that I ever cruised on the line,' began the Englishman. "'I was ignorant of the white whale at that time. "'Well, one day we lowered for a pod of four or five whales, "'and my boat fastened to one of them. "'A regular circus horse he was, too, "'that went milling and milling round so, "'that my boat's crew could only trim dish "'by setting all their sterns on the outer gunwale.' Presently up breaches from the bottom of the sea a bouncing great whale, with a milky white head and hump, all crow's feet and wrinkles. It was he! It was he! cried Ahab, suddenly letting out his suspended breath. And harpoon sticking in near his starboard fin. Aye, aye, they were mine, my irons! cried Ahab exultingly. But on! "'Give me a chance, then,' said the Englishman, good-humouredly. "'Well, this old great-grandfather, with a white head and hump, "'runs all a-foam into the pod, "'and goes to snapping furiously at my fast-line. "'Aye, I see. Wanted to part it. Free the fast fish. "'An old trick. I know him.' "'How it was exactly,' continued the one-armed commander, "'I do not know. But in biting the line it got foul of his teeth.' "'Caught there somehow, but we didn't know it then, "'so that when we afterwards pulled on the line, "'bounce we came plump on to his hump, "'instead of the other whales that went off to windward, all fluking. "'Seeing how matters stood, and what a noble great whale it was, "'the noblest and biggest I ever saw, sir, in my life, "'I resolved to capture him, "'in spite of the boiling rage he seemed to be in, "'and thinking the haphazard line would get loose, or the tooth it was tangled to might draw, for I have a devil of a boat's crew for a pull on a whale line. Seeing all this, I say, I jumped into my first mate's boat. Now, Mr. Mounttop's here. And by the way, Captain, Mounttop, Mounttop, the captain. As I was saying, I jumped into Mounttop's boat, which, do you see, was gunnel and gunnel with mine. Then, snatching the first harpoon, let this old great-grandfather have it. But, Lord, look you, sir. "'Hearts and souls alive, man. "'The next instant, in a jiff, I was blind as a bat, both eyes out, 
all befogged and bedeadened with black foam, the whale's tail looming straight up out of it, perpendicular in the air like a marble steeple. No use sterning all then, but as I was groping at midday, with a blinding sun all crown jewels, as I was groping, I say, after the second iron to toss it overboard, down comes the tail like a lima tower, cutting my boat in two, leaving each half in splinters, and flukes first the white hump backed through the wreck, as though it was all chips. We all struck out. To escape his terrible flailings, I seized hold of my harpoon pole sticking in him, and for a moment clung to that like a sucking fish. But the combing sea dashed me off, and at the same instant the fish, taking one good dart forward, went down in a flash, and the barb of that cursed second iron towing along near me caught me here, clapping his hand just below his shoulder. Yes, caught me just here, I say, and bore me down to hell's flames, I was thinking, when, when all of a sudden, thank the good God, the barb ripped its way along the flesh, clear along the whole length of my arm, came out nigh my wrist, and up I floated. And that gentleman there will tell you the rest. Uh, by the way, Captain, Dr. Bunger, ship surgeon. Bunger, my lad, the captain. Now, Bunger boy, spin your part of the yarn. The professional gentleman, thus familiarly pointed out, had been all the time standing near them, with nothing specific visible to denote his gentlemanly rank on board. His face was an exceedingly round but sober one. He was dressed in a faded blue woolen frock or shirt and patched trousers, and had thus far been dividing his attention between a marling spike he held in one hand and a pill-box held in the other, occasionally casting a critical glance at the ivory limbs of the two crippled captains. But at his superior's introduction of him to Ahab, he politely bowed, and straightway went on to do his captain's bidding. "'It was a shocking bad wound,' began the whale-surgeon, "'and taking my advice, Captain Boomer here stood our old Sammy—' "'Samuel Enderby is the name of my ship,' interrupted the one-armed captain, addressing Ahab. "'Go on, my boy.' "'Stood our old Sammy off to the northward to get out of the blazing hot weather there on the line. "'But it was no use. I did all I could, sat up with him nights, "'was very severe with him in the matter of diet.' "'Oh, very severe,' chimed in the patient himself, then suddenly altering his voice, "'Drinking hot rum toddies with me every night, till he couldn't see to put on the bandages, and sending me to bed half seas over, about three o'clock in the morning. Oh, ye stars! He sat up with me, indeed, and was very severe in my diet. Oh, a great watcher, and very dietetically severe as Dr. Bunger.' "'Bunger, you dog, laugh out, why don't you? "'You know you're a precious jolly rascal. "'But heave ahead, boy. "'I'd rather be killed by you than kept alive by any other man.' "'My captain, you must have ere this perceived, respected sir,' "'said the imperturbable, godly-looking Bunger, "'slightly bowing to Ahab, "'is apt to be facetious at times. "'He spins us many clever things of that sort.' But I may as well say, en passant, as the French remark, that I myself, that is to say, Jack Bunger, late of the reverend clergy, am a strict, total abstinence man. I never drink— Water! cried the captain. He never drinks it. It's a sort of fits to him. Fresh water throws him into the hydrophobia. But go on, go on with the arm story. Yes, I may as well, said the surgeon coolly. I was about observing, sir, before Captain Boomer's facetious interruption, that, spite of my best and severest endeavours, the wound kept getting worse and worse. The truth was, sir, it was as ugly, gaping a wound as surgeon ever saw, more than two feet and several inches long. I measured it with the lead line. In short, it grew black. I knew what was threatened, and off it came. But I had no hand in shipping that ivory arm there. "'That thing is against all rule,' pointing at it with the marling spike. "'That is the captain's work, not mine. "'He ordered the carpenter to make it. Uh, "'He had that club-hammer there put to the end "'to knock someone's brains out with, I suppose, "'as he tried mine once. "'He flies into diabolical passions sometimes. "'Do you see this dent, sir?' 
removing his hat, and brushing aside his hair, and exposing a bowl-like cavity in his skull, but which bore not the slightest scarry trace, nor any token of ever having been a wound. Well, the captain there will tell you how that came here. He knows. No, I don't, said the captain. But his mother did. He was born with it. Oh, you solemn rogue, you, you bunger. Was there ever such another bunger in the watery world? Bunger, when you die, you ought to die in pickle, you dog. You should be preserved to future ages, you rascal. What became of the white whale? now cried Ahab, who thus far had been impatiently listening to this by-play between the two Englishmen. Oh, cried the one-armed captain, oh, yes. Well, after he sounded, we didn't see him again for some time. In fact, as I before hinted, I didn't then know what whale it was that had served me such a trick, till some time afterwards, when coming back to the line, we heard about Moby Dick, as some call him, and then I knew it was he. Didst thou cross his wake again? Twice. But could not fasten? Didn't want to try to. Ain't one limb enough? What should I do without this other arm? And I'm thinking Moby Dick doesn't bite so much as he swallows. Well, then, interrupted Bunger, give him your left arm for bait to get the right. Do you know, gentlemen, very gravely and mathematically bowing to each captain in succession, do you know, gentlemen, that the digestive organs of the whale are so inscrutably constructed by divine providence that it is quite impossible for him to completely digest even a man's arm? And he knows it, too. So that what you take for the white whale's malice is only his awkwardness. For he never means to swallow a single limb. He only thinks to terrify by faints. But sometimes he is like the old juggling fellow, formerly a patient of mine in Ceylon, that making believe to swallow jackknives, once upon a time let one drop into him in good earnest, and there it stayed for a twelve-month or more. When I gave him an emetic, and he heaved it up in small tacks, do you see? No possible way for him to digest that jackknife and fully incorporate it into his general bodily system. Yes, Captain Boomer, if you are quick enough about it, and have a mind to pawn one arm for the sake of the privilege of giving a decent burial to the other, why, in that case, the arm is yours. Only let the whale have another chance at you shortly, that's all. No, thank you, Bunger said the English captain. He's welcome to the arm he has, since I can't help it, and didn't know him then, but not to the other one. No more white whales for me. I've lowered for him once, and that has satisfied me. There would be great glory in killing him, I know that, and there is a shipload of precious sperm in him. But hark ye, he's best let alone. Don't you think so, captain? Glancing at the ivory leg. He is but he will still be hunted for all that. What's best let alone, that accursed thing is not always what least allures. He's all a magnet. How long since thou saw him last? Which way heading? Bless my soul, and curse the foul fiends, cried Bunger, stoopingly walking round Ahab, and like a dog strangely snuffing. This man's blood! Bring the thermometer! It's at the boiling point! His pulse makes these planks beat. Sir, taking a lancet from his pocket and drawing near to Ahab's arm. Avast, roared Ahab, dashing him against the bulwarks. Man the boat. Which way heading? Good God, cried the English captain to whom the question was put. What's the matter? He was heading east, I think. Is your captain crazy? Whispering Fadala. But Fadala, putting a finger on his lips, slid over the bulwark to take the boat's steering oar, and Ahab, swinging the cutting tackle towards him, commanded the ship's sailors to stand by to lower. In a moment he was standing in the boat's stern, and the Manila men were springing to their oars. In vain the English captain hailed him. With back to the stranger ship, and face set like a flint to his own, Ahab stood upright till alongside of the Pequod. End of chapters 97 to 100 Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 101 to 104 Chapter 101 The Decanter 
Ere the English ship fades from sight, be it set down here that she hailed from London, and was named after the late Samuel Enderby, merchant of that city, the original of the famous whaling house of Enderby and Sons, a house which, in my poor whaleman's opinion, comes not far behind the united royal houses of the Tudors and Bourbons in point of real historical interest. How long, prior to the year of our Lord 1775, this great whaling-house was in existence, my numerous fish documents do not make plain. But in that year, 1775, it fitted out the first English ships that ever regularly hunted the sperm-whale, though for some score of years previous, ever since 1726, our valiant coffins and macies of Nantucket in the vineyard had in large fleets pursued that leviathan, but only in the north and south Atlantic, not elsewhere. Be it distinctly recorded here that the Nantucketers were the first among mankind to harpoon with civilized steel the great sperm-whale, and that for a half-century they were the only people of the whole globe who so harpooned him. In 1778 a fine ship, the Amelia, fitted out for the express purpose and at the sole charge of the vigorous Enderbys, boldly rounded Cape Horn, and was the first among the nations to lower a whale-boat of any sort in the great South Sea. The voyage was a skilful and lucky one, and returning to her berth with her hold full of the precious sperm, the Amelia's example was soon followed by other ships, English and American, and thus the vast sperm-whale grounds of the Pacific were thrown open. But not content with this good deed, the indefatigable house again bestirred itself. Samuel and all his sons, how many their mother only knows, and under their immediate auspices, and partly, I think, at their expense, the British government was induced to send the sloop-of-war Rattler on a whaling voyage of discovery into the South Seas. Commanded by a naval post-captain, the Rattler made a rattling voyage of it, and did some service, how much does not appear. But this is not all. In 1819 the same house fitted out a discovery whale-ship of their own, to go on a tasting cruise to the remote waters of Japan. That ship, well called the Siren, made a noble experimental cruise, and it was thus that the great Japanese whaling-ground first became generally known. The Siren, in this famous voyage, was commanded by a Captain Coffin, a Nantucketer. All honour to the Enderbys, therefore, whose house, I think, exists to the present day, though doubtless the original Samuel must long ago have slipped his cable for the great South Sea of the other world. The ship named after him was worthy of the honour, being a very fast sailor and a noble craft in every way. I boarded her once at midnight somewhere off the Patagonian coast, and drank good flip down in the forecastle. It was a fine gam we had, and they were all trumps, every soul on board, a short life to them and a jolly death. And that fine gam I had, long, very long after old Ahab touched her planks with his ivory heel, it minds me of the noble, solid Saxon hospitality of that ship, and may my parson forget me and the devil remember me if ever I lose sight of it. Flip? Did I say we had flip? Yes, and we flipped it at the rate of ten gallons the hour, and when the squall came, for it's squally off there by Patagonia, and all hands, visitors and all, were called to reef topsails, we were so top-heavy that we had to swing each other aloft in bowlands, and we ignorantly furled the skirts of our jackets into the sails, so that we hung there, reefed fast in the howling gale, a warning example to all drunken tars. However, the mast did not go overboard, and by and by we scrambled down, so sober that we had to pass the flip again, though the savage salt spray bursting down the forecastle scuttle rather too much diluted and pickled it to my taste. The beef was fine, tough but with body in it. They said it was bull beef, others that it was dromedary beef, but I do not know for certain how that was. They had dumplings, too, small but substantial, symmetrically globular, and indestructible dumplings. 
I fancied you could feel them, and roll them about in you after they were swallowed. If you stooped over too far forward, you risked their pitching out of you like billiard balls. The bread, but that couldn't be helped. Besides, it was an anti-scorbutic. In short, the bread contained the only fresh fare they had. But the forecastle was not very light, and it was very easy to step over into a dark corner when you ate it. But all in all, taking her from truck to helm, considering the dimensions of the cook's boilers, including his own live parchment boilers, fore and aft, I say, the Samuel Enderby was a jolly ship, of good fare and plenty, fine flip and strong, crack fellows all, and capital from boot heels to hat band. But why was it, think ye, that the Samuel Enderby, and some other English whalers I know of, not all, though, were such famous hospitable ships, that passed round the beef and the bread and the can and the joke, and were not soon weary of eating and drinking and laughing? I will tell you, the abounding good cheer of these English whalers is a matter for historical research, nor have I been at all sparing of historical whale research, when it is seemed needed. The English were preceded in the whale fishery by the Hollanders, Zealanders, and Danes, from whom they derived many terms still extant in the fishery, and what is yet more, their fat old fashions, touching plenty to eat and drink. For, as a general thing, the English merchant ship scrimps her crew, but not so the English whaler. Hence, in the English, this thing of whaling good cheer is not normal and natural, but incidental and particular, and therefore must have some special origin, which is here pointed out, and will be still further elucidated. During my researches in the Leviathanic histories, I stumbled upon an ancient Dutch volume, which, by the musty whaling smell of it, I knew must be about whalers. The title was Dan Koopman, wherefore I concluded that this must be the invaluable memoirs of some Amsterdam cooper in the fishery, as every whale-ship must carry its cooper. I was reinforced in this opinion by seeing that it was the production of one Fitz Swackhammer. But my friend, Dr. Snodhead, a very learned man, professor of low Dutch and high German in the College of Santa Claus and St. Potts, to whom I handed the work for translation, giving him a box of sperm candles for his trouble, this same Dr. Snodhead, so soon as he spied the book, assured me that Dan Koopman did not mean the cooper, but the merchant. In short, this ancient and learned low Dutch book treated of the commerce of Holland, and, among other subjects, contained a very interesting account of its whale fishery. And in this chapter it was headed smear, or fat, that I found a long, detailed list of the outfits for the larders and cellars of 180 sail of Dutch whalemen, from which list, translated by Dr. Snodhead, I transcribe the following. 400,000 pounds of beef, 60,000 pounds Friesland pork, 150,000 pounds of stockfish, 550,000 pounds of biscuit, 72,000 pounds of soft bread, 2,800 firkins of butter, 20,000 pounds Texel and Leiden cheese, 144,000 pounds cheese, probably an inferior article, 550 anchors of Geneva, 10,800 barrels of beer. Most statistical tables are parchingly dry in the reading. Not so in the present case, however, where the reader is flooded with whole pipes, barrels, quarts, and gills of good gin and good cheer. At the time I devoted three days to the studious digesting of all this beer, beef, and bread, during which many profound thoughts were incidentally suggested to me, capable of a transcendental and platonic application, and furthermore I compiled supplementary tables of my own, touching the probable quantity of stockfish, etc., consumed by every low Dutch harpooner in that ancient Greenland and Spitsbergen whale fishery. In the first place, the amount of butter and Texel and Leiden cheese consumed seems amazing. I impute it, though, to their naturally unctuous natures, 
being rendered still more unctuous by the nature of their vocation, and especially by their pursuing their game in those frigid polar seas, on the very coasts of that Eskimo country where the convivial natives pledge each other in bumpers of train oil. The quantity of beer, too, is very large, 10,800 barrels. Now, as those polar fisheries could only be prosecuted in the short summer of that climate, so that the whole crews of one of these Dutch whalemen, including the short voyage to and from the Spitsbergen Sea, did not much exceed three months, say, and reckoning thirty men to each of their fleet of 180 sail, we have 5,400 low Dutch seamen in all. Therefore, I say, we have precisely two barrels of beer per man for a twelve weeks allowance, exclusive of his fair proportion of that five hundred and fifty anchors of gin. Now, whether these gin and beer harpooners, so fuddled as one might fancy them to have been, were the right sort of men to stand up in a boat's head and take good aim at flying whales, this would seem somewhat improbable. Yet they did aim at them, and hit them too. But this was very far north, be it remembered, where beer agrees well with the constitution. Upon the equator, in our southern fishery, beer would be apt to make the harpooner sleepy at the masthead and boozy in his boat, and grievous loss might ensue to Nantucket and New Bedford. But no more. Enough has been said to show that the old Dutch whalers of two or three centuries ago were high livers and that the English whalers have not neglected so excellent an example. For, say they, when cruising in an empty ship, if you can get nothing better out of the world, get a good dinner out of it at least. And this empties the decanter. Chapter 102 A Bower in the Arsacides Hitherto, in descriptively treating of the sperm whale, I have chiefly dwelt upon the marvels of his outer aspect, or, separately and in detail, upon some few interior structural features. But to a large and thorough sweeping comprehension of him, it behooves me now to unbutton him still further, and, untagging the points of his hose, unbuckling his garters, and casting loose the hooks and eyes of the joints of his innermost bones, set him before you in his ultimatum, that is to say, in his unconditional skeleton. But how now, Ishmael? How is it that you, a mere oarsman in the fishery, pretend to know aught about the subterranean parts of the whale? Did erudite stub mounted upon your capstan deliver lectures on the anatomy of the cetacea, and by help of the windlass hold up a specimen rib for exhibition? Explain thyself, Ishmael. Can you land a full-grown whale on your deck for examination, as a cook dishes a roast pig? Surely not. A veritable witness have you hitherto been, Ishmael, but have a care how you seize the privilege of Jonah alone, the privilege of discoursing upon the joists and beams, the rafters, ridgepoles, sleepers, and underpinnings, making up the framework of the Leviathan and be like of the tallow-vats, dairy-rooms, butteries, and cheeseries in his bowels. I confess that since Jonah few whalemen have penetrated very far beneath the skin of the adult whale. Nevertheless I have been blessed with an opportunity to dissect him in miniature. In a ship I belonged to, a small cub sperm-whale was once bodily hoisted to the deck for his poke, or bag, to make sheaths for the barbs of the harpoons, and for the heads of the lances. Think you I let that chance go, without using my boat-hatchet and jackknife, and breaking the seal and reading all the contents of that young cub? And as for my exact knowledge of the bones of the leviathan in their gigantic, full-grown development— for that rare knowledge I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, king of Tranc, one of the Arsacides. For being at Tranc, years ago, when attached to the trading ship Day of Algiers, I was invited to spend part of the Arsacidean holidays with the lord of Tranc, at his retired palm villa at Pupella, a seaside glen not very far distant from what our sailors called Bamboo Town, his capital. 
Among many other fine qualities, my royal friend Tranquo, being gifted with a devout love for all matters of barbaric vertu, had brought together in Pupella whatever rare things the more ingenious of his people could invent, chiefly carved woods of wonderful devices, chiseled shells, inlaid spears, costly paddles, aromatic canoes, and all these distributed among whatever natural wonders the wonder-freighted, tribute-rendering waves had cast upon his shores. Chief among the latter was a great sperm-whale, which, after an unusually long, raging gale, had been found dead and stranded, with his head against a coconut tree, whose plumage-like tufted droopings seemed his verdant jet. When the vast body had at last been stripped of its fathom-deep enfoldings, and the bones became dust-dry in the sun, then the skeleton was carefully transported up the Pupella Glen, where a grand temple of lordly palms now sheltered it. The ribs were hung with trophies, the vertebrae were carved with arsacidean annals, in strange hieroglyphics, in the skull the priests kept up an unextinguished aromatic flame, so that the mystic head again sent forth its vapory spout, while suspended from a bough, the terrific lower jaw vibrated over all the devotees, like the hair-hung sword that so affrighted Damocles. It was a wondrous sight. The wood was green as mosses of the icy glen. The trees stood high and haughty, feeling their living sap. The industrious earth beneath was as a weaver's loom, with a gorgeous carpet on it, whereof the ground-vine tendrils formed the warp and woof, and the living flowers the figures. All the trees, with all their laden branches, all the shrubs and ferns and grasses, the message-carrying air, all these unceasingly were active. Through the lacings of the leaves the great sun seemed a flying shuttle, weaving the unwearied verdure. O oh, busy weaver, unseen weaver, pause, one word, whither flows the fabric, what palace may it deck, wherefore all these ceaseless toilings, speak, weaver, stay thy hand, but one single word with thee. Nay, the shuttle flies, the figures float from forth the loom, the freshet rushing carpet forever slides away, the weaver god, he weaves, and by that weaving is he deafened, that he hears no mortal voice. And by that humming, we too who look on the loom are deafened, and only when we escape it shall we hear the thousand voices that speak through it. For even so it is in all material factories, the spoken words that are inaudible among the flying spindles, those same words are plainly heard without the walls, bursting from the opened casements. Thereby have villainies been detected. Ah, mortal, then be heedful, for so in all this din of the great world's loom thy subtlest thinkings may be overheard afar. Now amid the green, life-restless loom of that Arsacidean wood, the great, white, worshipped skeleton lay lounging, a gigantic idler, Yet, as the ever-woven, verdant warp and woof intermixed and hummed around him, the mighty idler seemed the cunning weaver, himself all woven over with the vines, every month assuming greener, fresher verdure, but himself a skeleton. Life folded death, death trellised life, the grim god wived with youthful life, and begat him curly-headed glories. Now when with the royal Tranquo I visited this wondrous whale, and saw the skull and altar and the artificial smoke ascending from where the real jet had issued, I marveled that the king should regard a chapel as an object of vertu. He laughed. But more I marveled that the priest should swear that smoky jet of his was genuine. To and fro I paced before this skeleton, brushed the vines aside, broke through the ribs, and with a ball of Arsacidean twine, wandered, eddied long amid its many winding, shaded colonnades and arbors. But soon my line was out, and following it back, I emerged from the opening where I entered. I saw no living thing within. Naught was there but bones. Cutting me a green measuring-rod, I once more dived within the skeleton. 
From their arrow slit in the skull, the priests perceived me taking the altitude of the final rib. How now, they shouted, darest thou measure this, our god? That's for us. Ay, priests, well, how long do you make him, then? But hereupon a fierce contest rose among them, concerning feet and inches. They cracked each other's sconces with their yardsticks. The great skull echoed, and seizing that lucky chance, I quickly concluded my own admeasurements. These admeasurements I now propose to set before you. But first be it recorded that, in this matter, I am not free to utter any fancied measurement I please, because there are skeleton authorities you can refer to to test my accuracy. There is a Leviathanic Museum, they tell me, in Hull, England, one of the whaling ports of that country, where they have some fine specimens of finbacks and other whales. Likewise I have heard that in the Museum of Manchester in New Hampshire, they have what the proprietors call, quote, the only perfect specimen of a Greenland or river whale in the United States, end quote. Moreover, at a place in Yorkshire, England, Burton Constable by name, a certain Sir Clifford Constable has in his possession the skeleton of a sperm whale, but of moderate size, by no means of the full-grown magnitude of my friend King Tranquo's. In both cases the stranded whales to which these two skeletons belonged were originally claimed by their proprietors upon similar grounds, King Tranquo seizing his because he wanted it, and Sir Clifford because he was lord of the seigneuries in those parts. Sir Clifford's whale has been articulated throughout, so that like a great chest of drawers you can open and shut him in all of his bony cavities, spread out his ribs like a gigantic fan, and swing all day upon his lower jaw. Locks are to be put upon some of his trap doors and shutters, and a footman will show round future visitors with a bunch of keys at his side. Sir Clifford thinks of charging tuppence for a peep at the whispering gallery in the spinal column, threepence to hear the echo of the hollow of his cerebellum, and sixpence for the unrivalled view from his forehead. The skeleton dimensions I shall now proceed to set down are copied verbatim from my right arm, where I had them tattooed, as in my wild wanderings at that period there was no other secure way of preserving such valuable statistics, but as I was crowded for space, and wished the other parts of my body to remain a blank page for a poem I was then composing, at least what untattooed parts might remain, I did not trouble myself with the odd inches, nor indeed should inches at all enter into a congenial admeasurement of the whale. Chapter 103. Measurement of the Whale's Skeleton in the first place, I wish to lay before you a particular plain statement touching the living bulk of this leviathan, whose skeleton we are briefly to exhibit. Such a statement may prove useful here. According to a careful calculation I have made, and which I partly base upon Captain Scoresby's estimate of seventy tons for the largest size Greenland whale of sixty feet in length, According to my careful calculation, I say, a sperm whale of the largest magnitude, between eighty-five and ninety feet in length, and something less than forty feet in its fullest circumference, such a whale will weigh at least ninety tons, so that reckoning thirteen men to a ton, he would considerably outweigh the combined population of a whole village of one thousand one hundred inhabitants. Think you not, then, that brains like yoked cattle should be put to this leviathan, to make him at all budge to any landsman's imagination? Having already in various ways put before you his skull, spout-hole, jaw, teeth, tail, forehead, fins, and diverse other parts, I shall now simply point out what is most interesting in the general bulk of his unobstructed bones— but as the colossal skull embraces so very large a proportion of the entire extent of the skeleton, as it is by far the most complicated part, and as nothing is to be repeated concerning it in this chapter, you must not fail to carry it in your mind, or under your arm, as we proceed, otherwise you will not gain a complete notion of the general structure we are about to view. 
In length, the sperm whale's skeleton at Trank measured 72 feet, so that when fully invested and extended in life, he must have been 90 feet long, for in the whale the skeleton loses about one-fifth in length compared with the living body. Of this 72 feet, his skull and jaw comprised some 20 feet, leaving some 50 feet of plain backbone. Attached to this backbone, for something less than a third of its length, was the mighty circular basket of ribs which once enclosed his vitals. To me this vast ivory-ribbed chest, with the long unrelieved spine, extending far away from it in a straight line, not a little resembled the hull of a great ship new laid upon the stocks, when only some twenty of her naked bow-ribs are inserted, and the keel is otherwise, for the time, but a long disconnected timber. The ribs were ten on a side. The first, to begin from the neck, was nearly six feet long, the second, third, and fourth were each successively longer, till you came to the climax of the fifth, or one of the middle ribs, which measured eight feet and some inches. From that part the remaining ribs diminished, till the tenth and last only spanned five feet and some inches. In general thickness they all bore a seemly correspondence to their length. The middle ribs were the most arched. In some of the Arsacides they are used for beams, whereon to lay footpath bridges over small streams. In considering these ribs I could not but be struck anew, with the circumstance, so variously repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale is by no means the mould of his invested form. The largest of the trank ribs, one of the middle ones, occupied that part of the fish which, in life, is greatest in depth. Now the greatest depth of the invested body of this particular whale must have been at least sixteen feet, whereas the corresponding rib measured but little more than eight feet, so that this rib only conveyed half of the true notion of the living magnitude of that part. Besides, for some way, where I now saw but a naked spine, all that had been once wrapped round with tons of added bulk in flesh, muscle, blood, and bowels. Still more, for the ample fins, I here saw but a few disordered joints, and, in place of the weighty and majestic, but boneless flukes, an utter blank. How vain and foolish, then, thought I, for timid, untravelled man to try to comprehend aright this wondrous whale by merely poring over his dead, attenuated skeleton, stretched in this peaceful wood. No, only in the heart of quickest perils, only when within the eddyings of his angry flukes, only on the profound, unbounded sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. But the spine, for that the best way we can consider it is, with a crane, to pile its bones high up on end. No speedy enterprise, but now it's done, it looks much like Pompey's pillar. There are forty and odd vertebrae in all, which in the skeleton are not locked together. They mostly lie like the great knobbed blocks on a gothic spire, forming solid courses of heavy masonry. The largest, a middle one, is in width something less than three feet, and in depth more than four. The smallest, where the spine tapers away into the tail, is only two inches in width, and looks something like a white billiard ball. I was told that there were still smaller ones, but that they had been lost by some little cannibal urchins, the priest's children, who had stolen them to play marbles with. Thus we see how that the spine of even the hugest of living things tapers off at last into simple child's play. Chapter 104 The Fossil Whale From his mighty bulk the whale affords a most congenial theme whereon to enlarge, amplify, and generally expatiate. Would you, you could not compress him. By good rights he should only be treated of in imperial folio. Not to tell over again his furlongs from spiracle to tail, and the yards he measures about the waist, only think of the gigantic involutions of his intestines, where they lie in him like great cables and hawsers coiled away in the subterranean orlop deck of a line of battleship. 
Since I have undertaken to manhandle this leviathan, it behooves me to approve myself omnisciently exhaustive in the enterprise, not overlooking the minutest seminal germs of his blood, and spinning him out to the uttermost coil of his bowels. Having already described him in most of his present habitatory and anatomical peculiarities, it now remains to magnify him in an archaeological, fossiliferous, and antediluvian point of view. Applied to any other creature than the leviathan, to an ant or a flea, such portly terms might justly be deemed unwarrantably grandiloquent. But when leviathan is the text, the case is altered. Fain am I to stagger to this emprise under the weightiest words of the dictionary. And here be it said, that whenever it has been convenient to consult one in the course of these dissertations, I have invariably used a huge quarto edition of Johnson, expressly purchased for that purpose, because that famous lexicographer's uncommon personal bulk more than fitted him to compile a lexicon to be used by a whale author like me. One often hears of writers that rise and swell with their subject, though it may seem but an ordinary one. How then with me writing of this leviathan? Unconsciously my chirography expands into placard capitals. Give me a condor's quill. Give me Vesuvius's crater for an inkstand. Friends, hold my arms. For in the mere act of penning my thoughts of this leviathan, they weary me, and make me faint with their outreaching comprehensiveness of sweep, as if to include the whole circle of the sciences, and all the generations of whales, and men, and mastodons, past, present, and to come, with all the revolving panoramas of empire on earth, and throughout the whole universe, not excluding its suburbs. Such and so magnifying is the virtue of a large and liberal theme. We expand to its bulk. To produce a mighty book, you must choose a mighty theme. No great and enduring volume can ever be written on the flea, though many there be who have tried it. Ere entering upon the subject of fossil whales, I present my credentials as a geologist, by stating that in my miscellaneous time I have been a stonemason, and also a great digger of ditches, canals, and wells, wine vaults, and cellars, and cisterns of all sorts. Likewise, by way of preliminary, I desire to remind the reader that while in the earlier geological strata there are found fossils of monsters now almost completely extinct, the subsequent relics discovered in what are called the tertiary formations seem the connecting, or at any rate intercepted, links between the anti-chronical creatures and those whose remote posterity are said to have entered the ark. All the fossil whales hitherto discovered belong to the tertiary period, which is the last preceding the superficial formations. And, though none of them precisely answer to any known species of the present time, they are yet sufficiently akin to them in general respects to justify their taking rank as cetacean fossils. Detached broken fossils of pre-Adamite whales, fragments of their bones and skeletons, have within thirty years past, at various intervals, been found at the base of the Alps, in Lombardy, in France, in England, in Scotland, and in the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. Among the more curious of such remains is part of a skull, which in the year 1779 was disinterred in the Rue Dauphin in Paris, a short street opening almost directly upon the palace of the Tuileries, and bones disinterred in excavating the great docks of Antwerp in Napoleon's time. Cuvier pronounced these fragments to have belonged to some utterly unknown leviathanic species. But by far the most wonderful of all cetacean relics was the almost complete vast skeleton of an extinct monster found in the year 1842 on the plantation of Judge Cree in Alabama. The awe-stricken, credulous slaves in the vicinity took it for the bones of one of the fallen angels. The Alabama doctors declared it a huge reptile and bestowed upon it the name of Basilosaurus. But some specimen bones of it being taken across the sea to Owen, the English anatomist, it turned out that this alleged reptile was a whale, 
though of a departed species. A significant illustration of the fact, again and again repeated in this book, that the skeleton of the whale furnishes but little clue to the shape of his fully invested body. So Owen rechristened the monster Zuglodon, and in his paper, read before the London Geological Society, pronounced it in substance one of the most extraordinary creatures which the mutations of the globe have blotted out of existence. When I stand among these mighty leviathan skeletons, skulls, tusks, jaws, ribs, and vertebrae, all characterized by partial resemblances to the existing breeds of sea monsters, but at the same time bearing, on the other hand, similar affinities to the annihilated anti-chronicle leviathans, their incalculable seniors, I am, by a flood, borne back to that wondrous period, ere time itself can be said to have begun, for time began with man. Here Saturn's grey chaos rolls over me, and I obtain dim, shuddering glimpses into those polar eternities, when wedged bastions of ice pressed hard upon what are now the tropics, and in all the twenty-five thousand miles of this world's circumference, not an inhabitable hand's breadth of land was visible. Then the whole world was the whales, and, king of creation, he left his wake along the present lines of the Andes and the Himalayas. Who can show a pedigree like Leviathan? Ahab's harpoon had shed older blood than the pharaohs. Methuselah seems a schoolboy. I look round to shake hands with Shem. I am horror-struck at this anti-mosaic, unsourced existence of the unspeakable terrors of the whale, which, having been before all time, must needs exist after all humane ages are over. But not alone has this leviathan left his pre-Adamite traces in the stereotype plates of nature, and in limestone and marl bequeathed his ancient bust. But upon Egyptian tablets, whose antiquity seems to claim for them an almost fossiliferous character, we find the unmistakable print of his fin. In an apartment of the great temple of Dendera, some fifty years ago, there was discovered upon the granite ceiling a sculptured and painted planisphere abounding in centaurs, griffins, and dolphins, similar to the grotesque figures on the celestial globe of the moderns. Gliding among them, old leviathan swam as of yore, was there swimming in that planisphere centuries before Solomon was cradled. Nor must there be omitted another strange attestation of the antiquity of the whale, in his own osseous post-diluvian reality, as set down by the venerable John Leo, the old Barbary traveller. Not far from the seaside they have a temple, the rafters and beams of which are made of whale-bones, for whales of a monstrous size are oftentimes cast up dead upon that shore. The common people imagine that by a secret power bestowed by God upon the temple, no whale can pass it without immediate death. But the truth of the matter is that on either side of the temple there are rocks that shoot two miles into the sea, and wound the whales when they light upon them. They keep a whale's rib of an incredible length for a miracle, which lying upon the ground with its convex part uppermost makes an arch, the head of which cannot be reached by a man upon a camel's back. This rib, says John Leo, is said to have lain there a hundred years before I saw it. Their historians affirm that a prophet who prophesied of Mahomet came from this temple, and some do not stand to assert that the prophet Jonas was cast forth by the whale at the base of the temple. End quote. In this Afric temple of the whale I leave you, reader, and if you be a Nantucketer and a whaleman, you will silently worship there. End of chapters 101 to 104